Praise God. Welcome to Greater Love Ministry, a.k.a. Ashbury Park COP. Listen, it's so great for you guys to be with us. We know that the weather is horrendous outside and such troubling. We are just so grateful that you have allowed us to come into your homes, that we can share this word. We're still on our series talking about ego, talking about pride. And so today, as we come and we bring this, this teaching to a close, this series to a completion, on today, we're going to be talking about the faces of, of pride, ego, mm -hmm. the face of pride. We just an ego series, ye shall be as God. And this is the thing, talking about when we want to be in control, talking about when we take things into our own hand, we want to take control, we want to do things on our own, and certainly today's story really going to take us, and there's a lot of nuggets for us to hear and to understand. So if you have your Bibles, if you don't have them, Please go get your Bibles. Bring your family. Y'all come in, sit in, and hear the word together. We're going to the book of 2 Chronicles, chapter 32, and we're going to be starting at verse 18 to 25. So again, thank you so much for inviting us into your home. Hope you enjoyed this word. I hope it's relevant to where you're going through. I hope it's something you can relate to. I'm sure it will be. Listen, let's get into the word, and this is a reading of God's word. Then they cried with a loud voice in the Jews' speech unto the people of Jerusalem that were on the wall to affright them and to trouble them that they may take the city. And they spake against the gods of Jerusalem and against the gods of the people on the earth, which were the work of the hands of man. And for this call, Hezekiah the king and the prophet Isaiah the son of Amos prayed and cried to heaven. And the Lord sent an angel which, which cut off all the mighty men of valor and the leaders and the captains in the, in the camp of the king of Assyria, so he returned with shame of his face to his own land. And when he was coming to the house of his God, they that came forth of his own vows slew him there with the sword. Thus the Lord saved Hezekiah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem from the hand of Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, and from the hands of all other and guided them on every side. And many brought gifts unto the Lord to Jerusalem and present to Hezekiah, king of Judah, so that he was magnified in the, in the sight of all the nations from henceforth. And in those days, Hezekiah was sick to, unto, to death and prayed unto the Lord. And he spake unto him and he gave him a sign. But Hezekiah rendered not again according to the benefit done unto him, for his heart was lifted up. Therefore, there was wrath upon him and upon Judah and Jerusalem. Wow. We're talking about the faces of pride. You know, sometimes when we think about pride, pride has so many faces. There are so many attributes of pride. It's like a, 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 a slow killer. You won't even know that you're operating in pride. You won't even know that pride is something that you're, you, you, you're, you're really dealing with. And because of our egos and because of how we feel about ourselves, because of how we have you know, we want to be relatable to people, oftentimes we will ignore that tugging in our spirit or in our mind telling us, no, don't behave that way. No, that's not correct. No, that's not right. Isn't it something that we can know the right thing to do and not do it? Isn't it something we can know the right thing to say and not say it? Isn't it something that we can know to forgive and won't forgive? Like, you know, it's so many things that your ego and your pride will get in the way, will hinder, restrict you from doing that thing that you know to do that's right. In this, in this chapter, in these scriptures, we're going to learn about the many facets of pride because pride, there are facets like there are levels and stages of pride. And I know some of you are saying, Oh, no, Clavin, that's not me. I'm not prideful. I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't say that. I mean, I treat people kind. You know, I'm respectful to people. You know, I try not to look down on anyone. I try not to hurt anyone. I try not to do anything that will, you know, cause anyone to feel any kind of way. And maybe you are. But, you know, pride is not, there are so many stages and levels of pride. You can give somebody a proud look and look at them and like, oh, where are you? Or who are you? Or who do you think you are? I mean, it, it's so subtle. But here in the trenches of pride, we're going to see a little different. So let's go to the scripture. In verse 18, it says that they cried with a loud voice in the Jews' speech unto the people of Jerusalem that were on the wall to affright them and to trouble them that they may take the city. I want to give you a little background about this scripture. This scripture is the children of Israel. They are being pursued by the Assyrians. 
they were coming to attack Hezekiah. And listen, what they did, they had, they had already had stages that they were attacking. And, and you know the threat sometimes. When people feel like they conquered this and they conquered that, then they think they can conquer you too. And they feel like because they won here and they won there. See, we even see here the first facet of pride or the face face of first face of pride we see is the king of the Syrians. He feel like, you know what? I defeated that nation. I defeated that king. I defeated that king. So who are you? You're no different. And that's what pride makes you feel. It makes you feel superior. Your alter ego will begin to make you feel like, you know what? I've done it. Nobody can outdo me. And this is the background of, 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 of this attitude that's facing them. So he was so prideful that he himself didn't even come. What he did, he sent some of his men. He said, go and just use the speech and watch how you make them fearful. I want to talk to you because some of y'all, somebody is prideful in their ability to communicate to you, to intimidate you, to make you feel lower than what you should feel about yourself. Many times the enemy will use people to say things. He will use vocabulary and words to be condescending, to make people feel you're not intelligent enough, or use words to make you feel like, you know, you don't have enough information. You're not, you know, you, you, you're, you're not as well spoken. Or uh, uh, maybe, you know, they use words to describe things. And maybe the description they give you it don't have you looking in your very best light. So we have to really watch how the enemy uses words because we know words are spirit and life. So what is happening here, he don't send them to the city. They don't surround the city. The, the, the people of God, now they're encamped about trying to guard it. They're on the wall. And why are you up trying to do your job? Why are you up not trying to gain nothing that's not yours? Why are you trying to defend what's rightfully yours? Here come the enemy using words. Mm. So what do you do? What is the preparation when you're dealing with somebody with pride? I told you we're dealing with the faces of pride. I want to talk about first, what do you do when you're dealing with somebody who's prideful and using their pride against you? Now, the first thing you did, he said he cut off the waters from the enemy from the outside. Sometimes you got to stop the flow of other things coming into your mind. This thing is psychological. Before they even threw a, a, a spear or before they threw a bow, before they used a shield, the enemy comes with words, loud words, with a loud voice. And guess what? He, he came to use your speech, your language on you. See, that's why you have to watch what you say. That's why you have to mean what you say. Because what happens is the enemy will turn around and use what you said freely out of your own mouth and use it against you. And you know what? We have to watch this another facet of pride. Sometimes we get angry when we get reminded of things that we said while we were emotional. In, in, in and in 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 we were angry or a, a moment of haste. You said stuff, and then when you get reminded and your words get brought back to you, it can cause you to be frustrated, cause you to be irritated. It can make you angry. It can make you shut down because the enemy will use what you said against you. See, that's why you got to make sure that what you say is authentic, is truthful. You got to make sure what you say is truthful so that when it comes, it don't hurt you. See, what the enemy came with, the speech to them, the Bible said he used the speech to the people of Jerusalem that were on the wall to affright them. I'm going to make you afraid. I'm, I'm going to, listen, you have to understand when people are operating in their alter egos, when people's egos are inflated, when they're acting bigger than what they said, what they try to do, they try to use fear tactics to intimidate you. But I decree today, you're going to say, I will not be fearful. I'm not going to let my boss, I'm not going to let old friends, I'm not let relationship that's been broken. I'm not going to let any of those things come to intimidate me, to make me fearful and make me come down from the work. See, the wall, you've been, you've been positioned there to defend what you have. Whether you have to defend your family, your, your commitment to marriage, whether your commitment to God, whether your commitment to your career, your ambition, your commitment to finish something that you started. You got to stay on the wall. The enemy wants to intimidate you with words to make you come down. He said he came to affright them and to trouble them that they may take the city. The enemy knows before he can take anything from you, he has to deal with your mind. He has to make you already feel in your mind you're defeated. 
I come to let you know today you're not defeated. So all those thoughts telling you that you're not going to be successful, you're not going to make it, you're not going to be married, you're not going to have a family, you're not going to have a career, you know, whatever your dreams and your aspirations are, whatever is trying to intimidate you, I come to declare to you that you're going to make it, you're more than enough, you are efficient, God is on your side, you are dripping with favor, come on here. The sun of the morning light is upon you, and I decree to you that you're going to go all the way. You're not going to quit. You're not going to stop. You're not going to fall out. You're not going to allow what the enemy plan is to hinder you from obtaining and securing and defending what's rightfully yours. God gave you a dream. He gave you a vision. He gave you a promise. He gave you a prophecy. Stand on the wall and defend it. Don't come down. So what's happening is there's some things he did in preparation. He first had to watch his words, so he cut off the water. Sometimes you got to cut the words off, the, the overflow on the outside where the enemy would access to strengthen him against you. So what they did, they cut off the water so that the water could only flow internally. So the external waters where the enemy will come to refresh itself so he can fight against you to be stronger, you got to cut that off. They, they, they defiled the water, said, we're going to cut it out. So when you go to refresh yourself, you ain't got it. Come on here. What, what do you mean? What are you saying, Clayton? I'm telling you, when the enemy goes back to use your words, don't give him no more words to use against you. Don't taunt him. Don't inflate your words. That's how your ego got to be in check. Because when we speak and we over-exaggerate or we inflate what we say, you're giving the enemy access to, to draw from that thing to use against you. Just speak the truth plainly, directly, and let God do the rest. The second thing he did, he strengthened himself. When you see this account of scripture in 2 King, he talked to God. They went up, He said, what do you got? You got to strengthen yourself. Sometimes we ready to go to war, but your time of preparation isn't there. What do you mean strengthen yourself? Okay, you know you want to be married. You prepare for marriage. You don't just prepare. Don't just prepare negligees or boxes in the night, date night. You got to prepare your finances. You got to prepare your communication. You got to prepare, you know, uh, your, 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 to be able to accommodate somebody else's viewpoint, to be able to accommodate, accommodate somebody else's intellect. You got to be able to accommodate somebody else's shortcomings. See, we have to prepare, and what happens is our time of preparation is not there. So when we get put in there, we feel, oh, my God, like, I didn't know this was going to be this. I didn't know it was going to be this hard. I didn't know it was going to be this difficult. We don't put the time in. You want your degree? You got to prepare. I've been putting up a calendar trying to, so I can prepare my time. If I want to be effective in these next couple of months, this next year while I'm work, working on my Ph.D., guess what? I got to be prepared. I got to know how my time is going to be utilized. I got to know when this is due. Why I'm I don't want to be doing school work when I'm supposed to be doing ministry work. I don't want to be doing ministry work when I'm supposed to be doing school work. I have to balance my time. I got to know when I have a show, where I have the show. I have to be able to accommodate where I am. I looked at my schedule and I said, oh, my God, there's a clash. Because one day I'm supposed to be on a, 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 a workshop via Zoom. And it's the day I'm, I'm supposed to be on the airplane. So I had to re-evaluate. I had to make some adjustments. So we have to prepare because if we don't prepare, we will have chaos. So there is a preparation. Whatever you're doing, going to school, there's a preparation. If your job and you're looking for a new job, you should be preparing your outfits. You should be preparing your resume. You should be, there are preparation. What am I going to do? Okay, let me see. My schedule is going to be altered. So some things that I used to do, I'm not going to be able to do. So how am I going to work out my transportation? Don't wait until it happens. You prepare before it happens so that when it's time to execute, you're in place. The third thing he did, he made a decision. I will not be afraid. The enemy is coming with his threats. You're never going to make it. You're not good enough. Uh, what makes you think God's going to do it for you? See, because what he says, and when I read the scripture, I was reading over, over and over again. I read the accounts in Second Peter. I said, I can imagine you like, God, if you really for me, why are you even letting them attack me? Why won't you just handle it? You can just handle this. You've done it before. You threw the Egyptians in the Red Sea. So why won't you just handle this thing for me so I don't have to deal with it? But listen, God has to prove to you he is who he say he is, a savior, a deliverer, a way maker. And he has to let you, allow you to prove to yourself 
that you have faith, not in your swords, not in your spears, not in your speech, but your faith is in him. So for every struggle and every battle, there's a purpose. Oh, God, y'all won't let me help y'all in here. Listen, this thing was psychological warfare. Before you ever engage in any other, you're going to have to deal with the mindset of those who are trying to oppose you. And let me tell you something. Your opposition, ego is always inflated. The, the enemy's ego is already inflated, saying you're not going to make it. He's already feeling superior because in his eyes, you already look weak. He's looked down on you and said, ah, you are nothing. Because of what I've already done, who are you to stop me? Who are you to be great? Who are you to accomplish? You have to understand that your enemy ego is inflated. There's something you can learn from him. Don't allow your enemy in your mind. You have to fight to cast down vain imagination. You have to fight to keep your mind pure. There are times I have to say over and over, I am going to make it. I'm going to finish this PhD. I know I'm 53, but I'm going to finish this PhD. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it in excellence. I'm not going to wait. I ain't waiting until I get it. I'm doing it before the first workshop, before the first class, before my first paper. I'm making a declaration that I'm going to finish. I'm going to do it in excellence. It's going to be great. I, see, there's some things you got to prepare yourself for because the enemy is already coming to intimidate you too old. You know, why you waited this late? You should have did this in your 20s. You waited too late to do this. You know, you're going to struggle. You ain't got time for this. You know, you're not going to even use this degree. What are you doing this for? I mean, all these accusations, all these things to intimidate me. But my declaration is I shall complete it. I shall accomplish it and I shall finish it. Oh, that's my declaration. The two, number two, you're going to have to trust God. See, because the enemy asking you, why are you trusting God now? He sees you in a fight, and, 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 you know, he sees that, you know, all that you're going through. If he loves you so much, why even letting you go through this? I begged God when I was in my 20s, I wanted to go and get my PhD. I wanted to do it years ago, and he told me, no, 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 no. I was in my 30s. I said, God, I want to go get my PhD, and he said, no, no, no. And the reason I could be very honest, he said, you're too prideful. You didn't, want, you didn't want your PhD, you know, so you can go and teach or to help or assist. You just want so you can say, Dr. Clavin Leonard. <laughs> wow, that sounds amazing. Um, you know, every time I hear it, it just really sounds amazing. But God, I'm humbly saying it. Thank you, Lord. So what happened is my pride, because I wanted to prove because of my youth that I was who I was based upon the paper. Now I'm old, so I guess they can receive me now. Listen. <laughs> Not old, older, getting older. You know what I'm saying? So there are reasons. I'm honest enough to let you know that pride does come in many stages. So the enemy, when he comes, there's a level of preparation you have to have for yourself to say, I'm not going to let this get, I'm not going to let this get in my head. I'm not going to let this make me feel like God don't love me because he made me wait. Because many of y'all out there, you are upset, you're angry, and you're frustrated because God made you wait. But it's in your wake that you're developing character. You're developing a prayer life. You're developing patience. Patience having a perfect work in you. You're understanding the plan of God. You are maturing now. You're getting wisdom. There are so many nuggets you're getting in your process. That God knows if he would have gave it to you when you wanted, you'd have messed it up. And many of us can't be honest enough that we would have gotten pride. And pride comes before destruction. We would have we either we would have destroyed some people or we'd have destroyed ourselves or we'd have destroyed relationships based upon our own ego. Well, come on, let's go to verse 19. It said, and they spake against the God of Jerusalem and against the gods of the people of the earth, which was the work of the hands of man. Now, this is what I can appreciate about the enemy. They say, whether your God is natural or spiritual, it don't matter, they ain't gonna win. Because what they understood in the mix, everybody ain't sold out. If some people think that there are natural things that would save them, it might have been some people say, you know what, we, we believe God, God going to do it. But there were some people in that army, there were some people in that city saying, you know what, I got a spirit, I don't make me a spirit. If they come in here, this is what's going to save me. I got a bow and arrow, this is what's going to save me. So what they said, even your weapons ain't going to be adequate. Whether you, whether for those of you who, who were dependent on your God, 
it ain't gonna work. He gonna, he gonna, he, he's not gonna come through for you. And those of you who think you're skillful in craftsmen and think you're skillful at warfare, your men of valor, we come to let you know your weapons ain't good enough. We got weapons that are more advanced. We, we're more skillful in the use of our weapons than you have. And you know, we're good at what we do. Who are you? They can't intimidate. So they didn't care whether it was spiritual or natural. There are some people when they come to attack you, when their ego is inflated, they are so inflated by what they believe that they look down on whether it's spiritual or natural. They look, ain't nothing bigger than them. Ain't nothing greater than them. Because remember that their ego is laced with pride. Pride is, it, 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 is, it, it, it is the anatomy of, of, of your alter ego. It is so puffed up and inflated with what it thinks it is and how it feels it's superior and how everybody and everything is, is underneath them. You got to watch this enemy. The enemy comes to make you question God's love, protection, and provision for you. See, why they threw it? They were like, well, why he ain't in there? <laughs> Your God ain't showing up. Listen, ask the other, other countries what they got. They had their gods too, and, and where, where are they? We defeated them. They had weapons. They had a God. So your God different from theirs. Yes, my God is different from yours. So I'm not ashamed. You know, I respect people and what they believe, but what I'm not going to do, I'm not going to deny what I believe. I believe in Jesus Christ, the son of the living God. I believe that he will come through for me, that he's the savior of the whole world. I believe that every knee going to bow and every tongue going to confess that he's Lord. Now, I don't care what you believe. I'm not attacking what you believe. But guess what? I will defend what I believe. And guess what? I won't take it back. Now, listen what he begins to do. He tried to make you think, okay, he ain't going to protect you. Look, they, we still coming. And what they did, he sent a small hole, uh, you know, against him. He didn't bring the whole army yet. He said, but they coming. See, that's what the enemy does. He come in stages. They come with words. The other one come. And as they build with the people, they already don't use their words. Then you begin to expect. Your expectation can make you fearful. Like, oh, my God. Oh, here comes some. I see some more coming. Oh, my goodness. It's to make you get afraid, to make you nervous, to make you um, uh, anxious. I rebuke the spirit of being anxious. He wants to make you anxious about what's going to happen. Because as you see more and more people coming, can you see and you looking out over the wall and like, oh, my God, you looking at them. But this is what Hezekiah told him. There's more for us than against us. My God. There's an army that they can't even see. My God. That's what you got to remind to tell the people. You got to tell those who run with you. Listen, it's more for us than against us. God got us. Even though the enemy is throwing his threats out, I come to let you know God got us. He is more for us. God, if God be for us, who can be against us? Who can stand against us in our God? The other thing it says you have to tell what they did to others. The enemy wants to tell his testimony of what they did to other people. That's why you got to tell your testimony of what God has done for you. Because if you don't say what God done for you, the enemy is going to shout what the enemy did to other people. And you know he knows you always comparing yourself to others. He knows you think if others fail, you will fail. Or if others didn't make it, you won't make it. Or if others didn't get married, you won't get married. Or if others don't have kids, you won't have kids. If others didn't get the job, you won't get the job. I don't care what happened for others. I need somebody to scream right where they are. I am the exception. I don't care what didn't happen for nobody else. I am the exception. My God is going to come through for me. Somebody may need to go around their house and say, my God going to come through for me. I don't care what it looks like. I don't care what I'm facing. I'm not going to let pride get in my way. I'm not going to let this face of pride to come to intimidate me to make me feel that my God is not going to show up for me. Come on. I need somebody to know that you're exempt. Woo! I'm exempt. Mm. You defeated all them, but I'm exempt. I'm exempt from failure. I am exempt from depression. I'm going to be exempt from loneliness. Come on, confusion. There are things you got to say. It may happen, but I am going to be exempt. I am the exception for this. See, what he comes, he coming for relationships. He coming for your determination. And most importantly, he coming for your faith.
See, the enemy has a strategy that he's coming for you. They didn't just, this, this king of Assyria, he was very strategized with who he sent. He didn't just go come and just charge them and start fighting. No, get in your head because if he just come with your fight, you may fight back. But come for your mind and it will weaken your fight. Get in, get in somebody's head. They can, be, they can be 300 pounds and full of muscle, but if you get in their head, they'll still feel like a, a, a guy, a, a way 150 pounds can beat them if he can get in their head. There's a strategy for the victory. I keep telling y'all. I keep going back to there's a strategy for the victory. Now listen what he says. He, he In verse 20. And for this cause, Hezekiah the king and the prophet Isaiah, the son of Amos, prayed and cried to heaven. Somebody say, I'm just one prayer away. I'm one prayer away from my victory. I'm one prayer away from my deliverance. I'm one prayer away from my, my relationship being mended and healed. I'm one prayer away from my dreams and my aspiration being manifested. I'm one prayer. Is you just a prayer away? What the enemy don't want you to do? He's talking so much to distract you from praying. If you in his head, you won't pray. You meditating on what the enemy says. You thinking about the strategy of the enemy instead of praying to the God who will deliver you. Instead of praying to the God that's going to bring you out, you're being distracted. You're so busy listening to him, thinking about what he said, trying to understand why he, why he attacking you, trying to see what he's saying. Is it valid? Ain't got time for all that. You got to do what Hezekiah did. He was the king. He went and got with somebody who was prophetic. He connected with somebody who's spiritual, and he prayed. Listen, if you're a carnal and you don't know the voice of God or you don't know how to pray or you're unfamiliar with prayer, listen, come let us know. We'll put the number up there so you can call us. We want to pray with you. We want to connect with you. We want you to know that the enemy is not going to defeat you. Sometimes natural people have to connect with people who are a little bit more spiritual, people who are, are aspiring or moving in another level of faith to connect with and bombard heaven. The Bible says they prayed and they cried unto the Lord. <laughs> Prayer, your communication. <laughs> I will trust him. Come on, somebody. Come on. Right there where you are, say, I will trust him. My God. It's, yeah, I'm, the enemy is right there. He, he's right at my wall screaming accusation, but I will trust God. He's telling me that I'm not going to make it. He's, he's, his ego is inflated, telling me that nothing's going to work out for me. But I decree that my faith will not fail me. And when I get weak, my declaration, Lord, help my unbelief. My cry unto the Lord in my humility, help my unbelief. I believe that I can make it, but in my weak days, show me that I can make it. Help me believe that I can overcome. Remind me of the testimony that you're the same God that did it then. You'll do it now. And not only did you do it and do it now, you'll do it again and again and again. Come on here. The devil said, oh, he don't came through enough for you. I said, not so, devil. He going to come for me again and again and again. He going to keep coming through for you again again and again. He going to keep coming through for your family again, again, and again. Come on. You got to tell him this thing is perpetual. It's not going to stop. The same God that came through for me before is going to come through for me again. That's why you must have a testimony in your mouth. You must have something to let the devil know. I'm still standing after all I've been through. I'm still here after all that I've been through mentally, emotionally, physically. I'm still saying and decreeing I'm going to make it. The fact that you have a testimony that you are alive and you are breathing and you have the audacity to still believe God is enough to intimidate your enemy. Listen, one thing about the enemy is he wants to make you think that what you say don't, 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 don't frighten him. But he is. When you begin to declare that I'm strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Come on, somebody. I know you woke up and you had a rough week, but you say I'm strong in the Lord and the power of his might. I, 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 you know, I'm preparing for this week and I'm strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Come on. I need you to begin to declare my faith will not fail me. My faith will not fail me. Listen what he begins to deal with in verse 21. And the Lord sent an angel which cut off all the mighty men of valor and the leaders and the captains in the camp of the king of Assyria. So he returned with the shame face of his own land. And when he was coming to the house of his God, they that came forth from his own bowels slew him there with the sword. What happened? See, why are you praying? 
God is defending. While you're praying, God is already making a way. See, even though you're preparing, this battle is not yours. There are some battles that got God's name all over it. It's about his name. It's about your ability to believe him. It's about the testimony you gave. It's about the fact that you stood in faith that God has to come through for you. So while they were praying, the Lord sent an angel, which cut off all the mighty men. Everybody he thought that was going to intimidate. Now it ain't just the talkers. The real fighters God went to cut off. And all the leaders in the captain of the camp of Assyria. So he went into their camp, and even because all of them weren't even there yet, he killed all of them. The, the, the story said it was about 180,000 men that died. But this is the thing. Now, he was so inflated, thinking that he was just fighting you. But he fighting your God, too. <laughs> See, the enemy think it's just you that he's fighting. But somebody needs to, to, to boldly declare he's fighting my God too. It ain't just me. God said, if I be for you, I'm more than a world against you. And see, what he didn't understand, this battle, I ain't going to even have to fight. God's going to fight for me. My faith stood while God fought. The Bible said he returned with shame. See, that's what pride <laughs> comes before destruction, comes before a fall. He went back to his own country, his own land, shame. Everybody looking, you defeated all of them, and now you got defeated. Just when you thought you had it. See, that's what the enemy. You may be the last one on their list, and they think, surely after they got this, they're going to finish you. <laughs> but it ain't going to happen. Come on, somebody say, it ain't going to happen. I may be the last one on your list, but it's not going to happen. You've been crossing everybody else out that you did it, that you overcame, that you, you know, you did it, you intimidated them, you defeated them, you got in their head, you made them, but you won't. Do it to me. Come on, somebody. I need you to say, it won't happen for me. So you might as well look. I'm going to be a circle because I won't be a checklist. You won't check me off and say that you defeated me. I'm telling you, God wants to shame those. And when you puff up in pride and your ego is in control, you will leave with shame. When you so inflated about you in control and you got this, and when you begin to think what you're doing, what you have, what you achieve, that you don't need God, you in trouble. I want to tell you, humble yourself. If you've taken credit for who you are, you've taken credit for your victory, you've taken credit for your life, your career, your family, you know, your credit score, your, you know, your, your, your retirement plan, say it was by the grace of God. Say, I am what I am by the grace of God. It, it is nothing of my own that you can boast. It's God that did it. So what happened? The Lord sends help. Tell you, look, look at somebody. Look, if they're in your house, text your friends, say the Lord sending help. He sees that you're in distress. He sees that the enemy is attacking you, but the Lord is sending help. Uh, he made me write that down. Tell the people I'm sending help. My God. Oh, he's sending help. He's sending help. He sees that the enemy, he sees what you up against. He sees the intimidation. He sees the aggressiveness. He sees that he's trying to get in your head. But I want you to know the Lord himself is sending help. The second thing I want you to know, the enemy will be ashamed. Come on, say the enemy will be ashamed. The plot that he has to destroy you, it will not happen. The plot to destroy your marriage, your career, the, the, your vision, your dream, your business, it will not come to fruition. Now, we know he said that, you know, that, that the enemy will plot and strategize against us. You know, he didn't say the weapons weren't going to be formed, but he said they shall not what? Prosper. So don't get upset because the enemy has formed the weapons and, and they, they seem like they're going to win and they position themselves. Just know at the appointed time. God going to handle it. He won't win. See, we get caught up and we get into like, oh, my God. But do you see them? Oh, they're coming. There's a lot of them. Oh, my God. You got a weapon, but you get nervous. You got a weapon, but you forgot you got a hallelujah. You got a weapon, but you forgot you got a hand wave. God, I thank you. You got a weapon, but you forgot you had a dance. Come on here. You got a weapon, but you forgot that you had a voice. You had a holler, a holy holler that was set a nation free. See, what we do, you get intimidated, you forget what you got. 
And even though you have something to utilize, you'll become confused and you'll become anxious. You'll become nervous and not utilize what's even in your hand. Listen what the enemy he comes to do. He comes to break your communication. Mm -hmm. He's going to break your communication mm -hmm. so that you won't believe the help is coming. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He will try to let go. What, what does God do? While the enemy trying to tell you God comes, God comes to bring assurance that he is your divine protection. Listen, it's some things you can't defend yourself against. The accusation of people, if you even say something back, you're just going to make it get worse. There's some things you got to say, God, you got to protect me from. I can't, there's nothing I can do against that. If you, you ain't did nothing to people and they just don't like you and for whatever reason, there's nothing you can say to make them like you. You just got to turn them over to the Lord. I don't, I don't know what to do to make you like me if you just looked at me and don't like me. I don't know what to do if you don't like me because of my job or my education or, or you, you hate me because I got favor. There's nothing what I'm supposed to script myself a favor. God, don't let, me be, don't let me have favor so they can like me. God, don't let me be intelligent so they can like me. And let me tell you something. It's enough dumbing yourself down to accommodate others. The season is over and trying to be, to validate others to make them feel good while you, you know, you just make yourself look small so they can feel great. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to make myself small to make you feel great. If you don't feel great, you need to go to our God. Because it's our God that makes me great. It's no work of my own. We got to stop being intimidated or stop being great or feeling like I got to be less than to accommodate people who are insecure when they got the same God you got to go to who will make them confident. But see, people, your ego will make you confident in yourself. But you will, you will have a confidence because it's in the God that you serve. That's why the Bible says don't throw away your confidence because it has great recompense of reward. The reward is God is going to reward himself because he did it because it brought glory to his name. When you want to glorify yourself, you'll be defeated and you'll lose. Your ego will be inflated and you'll just be brought to shame. Come on, tell your neighbor, I, 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 I will not be brought to shame. And this is, this is the first phase of, of, of pride. Come on. So he said, and the Lord saved Hezekiah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem from the hand of Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, and from the hand of all other, and guided them on every side. And this is what blessed me. He gave them divine protection and favor everywhere. That means that no matter what came, see this is a place of faith y'all. You have to remember their stories like the woman who, who had the issue of blood or the woman who daughters were grievously vexed with the devil. There are places where there's such a great demonstration of faith that when you do it, God said you got card block. Whatever it is that you need, whatever it is that you believe, God said you got it. Come on, I got you covered. There could be one act of faith if you would just stand strong and believe God and trust God. God said, I'll do it that you won't have no more worries. I'll do it so you'll never be intimidated again. I'll do it so you'll be free of, of cares and worries and frustration. There comes a time you say, baby, I don't care what it is, God going to do it. I don't care what come against me, I'm going to be victorious. There is a place in faith. You just got to get there. Take the journey. Good God Almighty, I feel excited. There is a position in God where you trust him. There's a position in God where you stand in assurance that he's going to do it no matter what. I need somebody to say, God's going to do it no matter what. That's the kind of God I serve. I, I believe him. I trust him. I'm at that level of faith that my life is his. No matter what I do, I'm doing it by faith. No matter what, what steps I'm taking, I'm taking steps of faith. No matter what problem, I believe that it's going to be solved by an act of faith. No matter what objectives that I have, I believe that they'll be accomplished through an act of faith. Somebody needs to know it's going to take faith. But you know what you can't do? God is guiding. This is what this thing been. He guided them on every side. And I can't get away from the scripture that's been blessing me in this Proverbs 3, 4, uh, 3, 4, 5, and 6. They trust the Lord with all their heart. Lean not to their own understanding. But in all that ways, acknowledge him. He will direct them. Here you, this is an example. God didn't give an answer. He gave direction. He guided them. 
Sometimes God is not going to give direction. He's he not going to give answer. He's going to give you direction. It says, now here, it doesn't talk about he gave them more answers. He said, and from the hand of all others and guided them on every side, meaning he led them. He told them which way to go to avoid some things. Some fights you can avoid. I can't get no help in here now. There are some things that are avoidable. You don't have to fight every battle. Some things God will say, let me just give you the word to say to go around that argument. Let me give you something to say to go around that, 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 that confusion. He'll give you a way to maneuver around certain fights or certain battles need not even be fought. You don't want to spend your whole life fighting. Aren't you tired? That's my favorite line from the help. Aren't you tired, Miss Lizzie? Aren't you tired? <laughs> she was like, aren't you, aren't some of y'all, aren't you tired of letting your ego and your pride? Aren't you tired of being in arguments and being always on the, 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 the place of defense, always defending yourself? Aren't you tired of always saying everybody against you? Nobody wants to see you succeed. Nobody wants to see you make it. Aren't you tired? Of trying to do things in your own strength? Aren't you tired of making unwise decisions that cost you, your family, your career, your household? Your, you know, aren't you tired? It is simply time to trust God. Come on, yeah, yeah, I'm talking about you. It's time for you to trust him. It's a, and so what happened is now they've won. Now we live with, we're dealing with another facet of 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 of, of arrogance or pride or or, or, or we live, we're dealing with another face uh, uh, of pride, another ego. Now you got to deal with you want. You in charge. God don't did it for you. You got the family, you married, you got the children, you got the house, you have all these extra things. You have it now. Not everybody's celebrating you. The Bible says they brought presents to Hezekiah, the king of Judah. So he was magnified in the sight of all nations from henceforth. Not everybody know you won. See, you have to be careful because once everybody know you won, now the puff up ain't from external. Now you got to deal with internal. You've been dealing with all, everybody, never, nobody, nobody ever thought you would make it. Nobody ever thought you would be successful. Nobody ever thought you would be married. Nobody ever thought you would start your own business. Nobody ever, you no, know, everybody have these expectations. Now you're dealing internally with your issues. And now you've got a place of recognition. You found out that you're an attention junkie. I got to take a sip off of this. Hmm. I've been there, done that, failed, been dragged, and had to get up again because of my pride, because of my ego, because I won. Isn't it something when you win and nobody think you would win? They didn't choose you to win? See, let me give you a little story. No, I always have a little story. So when I was growing up, you know, with my siblings, because I was always the one that was more vocal. I was one always very boisterous. I, you know, I had something to say. I wanted to say it. I, I was adventuresome. I was, I was the one at five years old that I was traveling. They had to put a sign on me for me to come up to New Jersey to spend the summer with my uncle and them. While my sisters and brothers were intimidated, they were scared to, to, to travel without my parents. I was like, hey, I'll go. Put me on the plane. I'm ready to go. At five years old, I knew that I was destined to travel. It, it's nothing new. I knew that I was destined to, great, to go great places, and I was not afraid. And I always asked my mother, what made y'all make the decision to put me, a five-year-old, on a, like, you trusted me to do, like, you know what I'm saying? Even though, you know, they had the stewardess then, they called them stewardess then, and they, would came, they came and got me and set me in the front. It wasn't like first class like it is now. They stopped me at the front. Gave me a little airplane. They had little snacks for me. And when I got off the plane, they took me and, and you know, they gave me gum on so I would so I could chew. They took me and, you know, but my parents at five years old, I was like, Lord, I don't know if I would put my five-year-old on a plane. I don't know if I would feel that confident, you know, about them. And but my parents, they trusted the process. 
my mother said she always knew there was something, you know, there was something different about me. At 17, I went to Mexico by myself and stayed a whole summer. Then, you know, my first year of college, I left, I, I, I toured around. I was with some friends. I hung out in, in Europe. Like, I was never afraid, like, to go places where I didn't know people, who didn't know the language. I felt like anywhere my feet lay that I could make friends. But I had been reared to believe that. I had been reared to believe no matter where you go, you're going to make it. I believe. I don't care. You throw me anywhere. I believe I can make it. I was in South Africa. It was tough some days. But guess what? I was over there in a strange land where they were speaking 11 languages. It was hot. There was, you know, some days I ain't have no electricity because the, the whole country shut down, cut off the electricity. So nobody called low shit. And you don't have no electricity. Your food go bad. I mean, it's, it's crazy. But I survived. I thrive, and I believe that wherever you go, wherever I go, wherever I am, I can make it. God got people all over the world, and they may not even know. I, mean, I went to Bangkok one time. I had all this luggage, and they was like, they was like, ooh, you know, uh, claim we don't want you to go. Who going to help you with this stuff? I said, God got people. I was in line, and this man was like, hey, can I help you? And I ain't do nothing. Not only did he help me with my luggage, he got my cab paper, my cab, dropped it off at the hotel, carried my things up to the room. I'm telling you, I don't care where I've been. God had people to serve me, to help me, to assist me, no matter where I was. So I believe that there are people, when you're called to certain levels of greatness, it ain't that I can't do it by myself, but God calls for assistance because of who you are in God and who, what God has called you to do. So, you know, you have to watch that pride. Because pride, because you win and you can do things, you'll get, oh, I can go and I can do it. And then God has to bring you low. He has to bring you low. He has to make you remember that it's him. Because getting magnified in the eyes of people bring pressure to perform. It brings pressure to be puffed up, to have your ego inflated. To accommodate the expectations of people. I want to tell you, stop puffing yourself up to accommodate people impression of who they think you are. Be your authentic self. Stop inflating. Stop. You don't have to be more. Being who you are is more than enough. Just be you, boo. Be you. But this is the other facet. After you've been defeated. See, because when I was growing up, my family used to say, oh, he crazy, he bad, and he, you know, he wild. That's what they used to say about me. And it wasn't a lot, not all of it. Some of it was true. You know, I was bad. I was, you know, a little mischievous. You know, I was wild. I was crazy. I was dancing on tables in Paris. Yeah, I was, yes. They said, get on the table. I said, like, oh, I, I ain't never get to dance on my mama table. I'm going to dance on the table. Yes. I was dancing on tables, acting wild, getting drunk as Kudo Brown, smoking weed, smoking hash, eating mushrooms, everything. I was like, yes, this is the life. And I thought I was going to stay and tour around Europe. My mother was like, you better bring your blankety blank, blankety blank home. Yeah, cussed me all the way out and hung up on me. I said, well, y'all, I'm going to go home Tuesday because, you know, I don't really like it here anymore. Yeah, because I had been threatened. That if I didn't, I, I wasn't on that plane on Tuesday and she had to come get me, I didn't want to think about what that was going to be. So guess where I was? On that plane going back to school. I would say, you a fool? You think I'm going to pay you to go around there and be drunk and act a fool? You is out your mind. But my friend's parents did it for them. <laughs> she said, well, you know what? Go look in the mirror. <laughs> See? Yeah. She said, see who you are, know who child you are, and then you'll clearly see that that's never going to happen. And I did, and it never happened. <laughs> I came home. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but what I want to tell you is that sometimes when people didn't think you, you were going to measure up or they think you were wild, the flip side of that is that when things begin to happen for you, when you become more than what they thought you were, sometimes you want to add to that. You want to inflate that because they, remember, they didn't think you were going to be anything. They didn't think you were going to travel. Even when, you know, my fashion show and, and you know, and I thought about when they laughed at me at 13, when God told me that people walk up and down in my runway and when I did my first show and I had my first independent show and people really walking up and down the runway in my clothing, you know, I was like, wow. You know, there were two ways I could walk in humility and say, God, you did this. Or I could be like, oh, you see, you didn't think I was gonna look, look, look. Every crossroad, there's a decision to make, be made. 
There's a choice to make whether you're going to walk in humility or you're going to walk in pride. Whether you're going to let your ego get the best of you or you're going to let God get the glory from you. So here he is, he, another facet. After the victory, after something that wasn't supposed to happen for you, happens. The unexpected. Nobody expected Hezekiah to come through this. I'm speaking to some of you. Nobody expected you to make it. Nobody expected you to come through what you came through. Nobody expected you to overcome what you overcame. You must now fight pride within yourself. Now you got to fight your ego that wants to inflate itself and boast and show out and look down on people or look at how great you are or look at how you're so exceptional. You are the exception, but that don't make you exceptional in your flesh. You are the exception, but make sure you don't think you're exceptional on your own. It's God. Come on, I'm almost done, guys. It said, in those days, Hezekiah was sick unto death and prayed unto the Lord, and he spake unto him, and he gave him a sign. So you have to go to 2 King. What happened is Hezekiah now, his greatness, he don't been wrapped up in pride like a mummy, and now he don't got sick. Now, what is your sign that God don't gave you? What is a sign of your pride? The sign of Hezekiah's pride was his sickness. Some of y'all, what is a sign of your pride? Uh, this is a personal question. I'm not, I don't want to be in your business, and I don't want you in mine. What is the sign of your pride? Because God gives all of us a sign that we're being prideful, that we're operating in pride, that we don't went from humility, and now we're boastful, now we're arrogant, now we're looking and acting like we're better than everybody else. Now we, we're not acting like we're the exception. Now we're acting like we're exceptional in our own strength. Do you see it or do you feel it? The other thing, though, that your prayer, your greatness don't exempt you from sickness. And your prayer don't exempt you from a struggle. Or your prayer don't exempt you from suffering. Just because you got a prayer life don't mean you will never suffer. Just because you got a prayer life don't mean that God won't make you deal with what's in you internally. Because people think if they have a prayer life, that, ooh, they emptied out and ain't nothing in them and they, ain't, they wouldn't be proud. You could be proud for that when you pray, people respond. You could be proud for that when you pray that you get answers and people receive it and you, it's subtle but truthful. Why? Hezekiah was sick and he prayed to the Lord. He was like, Lord, he turned his back to the wall and prayed. He wanted to live. <laughs> See, one thing, pride, it wants to live longer so it can gloat longer. I hope I'm not talking about you because I'm sure talking about my past. I'm talking about me. It takes a real transparency to look at areas of your life, and it may not be pride for everybody to see, but you know yourself areas you've been proud. It could be your looks. It could be your body. It can be your ability to speak. It could be your intellect. The enemy will use anything that God gave you to stand out to bring honor to his name. You could be gifted in your hands. You could be gifted in your speech. Whatever it is that you've been gifted to do, the enemy wants to use that area. He wants to infiltrate that area and make you prideful about it. The ability to make friends anywhere or everybody like you or to be able to get along with everybody. He can make you prideful. Your ability to cook or to sew or to design or to create, whatever it is, he's after that area to make you prideful. It said, Hezekiah, the story says he's turned to the wall. He cried and he began to tell God, I've been faithful. Isn't that what we do? It's a sign of pride. What we do when, when things we go through, but God, I pay my tithes. Why, why am I going through in my finances? I gave my offering. Yeah, we got an area that we feel like we've done something and God, you owe me. You owe me because I've been faithful. Well, God, I've been faithful. I never cheated on my wife. Why would my marriage be in trouble? Why would my relationship be fragile? See, we got an area that whatever it is, you feel like there's a justification and we want to rehearse to God like God don't know what he did or God don't know your sacrifice or God don't know your attempt to do the right thing. See, that's an sense of pride that you're going to throw in God's face what you've done. 
See, it's two ways to look at it. He could have been reminding God, or he could have been saying, God, why you let me go through this? Because I've done this, 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 and this. But see, man just died with appearance, but God know the heart. Now, to us, it sounds like he's just reminding God. But evidently, in his heart, God judged something else. He gave him a sign. What was the sign? He sent the prophet. The prophet came and said, get your house in order. Because you surely about to die. He sent him a sign, and the prophet gave him the word. This is what we do. We have to give the people the word and leave. Don't try to explain the word. Or, I mean, I think what it meant is. No, give them the word and leave. After you've done your assignment, it ain't trying to entertain and, and, and dissect and try to, you know, teach what. No, this is what he said. You go to him for the rest. Remember, he had a prayer life. He already knew to pray. You see him turn his back to the wall. So I got to explain to you, you, you got communication with the father. Go to the father and ask him what he meant. So he turns his, he, he turns his back to the wall and prays. Before the prophet can leave the property, God speaks to him to, and turn it around. Go back and speak another word. So he turned around. See, this is what we got to pray. Well, I just told him that I ain't, I'm going to wait till tomorrow. No, you got to obey the voice of God when he speaks. See, sometimes we like, well, I already don't say something because if I go back now, they're going to be talking about, they're going to act like I'm just trying to say it. They're going to think that God ain't really said. See how your ego, see how pride can get in there? That you can get in trouble. Verse 25. But Hezekiah rendered not again according to the benefit done unto, uh, done unto him. Now, this is what blessed me. Why did he get in trouble? Because he forgot to give God the glory for what had happened. See, you talking and telling them, I thank God, but you're really giving glory to yourself. He rendered not again to the benefit done unto him. What God did for you is God benefiting from what he did for you? Are you really giving God his proper prop for what's going on in your life? I know you tell people, ah, God did it. <laughs> but in your heart, you think, oh, this me. I work hard for this. I train for this. I've been preparing for this. See, remember that pride is subtle. Your ego is inflated. Nobody can see it. It's internal inflation. Gas. That's, that's, that's what that is. That internal inflation. That's gas, baby. Get rid of it. It said, why? For his heart was lifted up. Man just the outward appearance, but God just the heart. See, you can be looking like every, but in your heart, they looking there feeling sorry for him because he's sick. But in his heart, he's thinking he's better than everybody else. See, he didn't learn from his predecessor, his enemy. The story is that not only when the king of Syria, when he went home, not only did God defeat him, he went home defeated in shame, but his own sons killed him. The sons came out of his own bow, they killed their own father. Now, now you ain't only shame, your legacy is tarnished and destroyed. What did you learn when you see what God did to those who operated in pride? Sometimes we can see people operate in pride. And so, child, I know I ain't going to never do And here you are in your heart. No, everybody don't see it. It ain't an outward demonstration. You're not using your words like them. But in your heart, you're not doing what you should do with what God has blessed you with. You're not honoring God and honoring him back for what he's given you. For the doors that he opened for you, for the successes that he's given you, from the favor that you have. You're not rendering to God. Now you're too busy. You can't pray. You're too tired. You know, all these things that you can't do for God because you got too much going on. But you asked for these blessings, knowing what your responsibilities were. You asked for these blessings, knowing what God said about your life. Like God can't pardon and excuse what he's asked you to do because you already know. Hezekiah didn't give God what he required. I, I, um, I preached a sermon one time talking about Jesus in the fig tree. What if God should get hungry? 
and your praise and your prayer was his food. And he came and it was nothing. He came and you didn't have a word. You didn't have a prayer. See, some of you, if God get hungry in the morning, you ain't got a prayer, you ain't got a scripture, and you ain't got a prophetic word. He's hungry in the morning, but you have nothing to feed him. He said, I want to use you to feed the body, but you ain't ready. You, you know, you're not prepared, and you was too tired, and you was too sleepy. You were doing all kind of other stuff. What if God should get hungry? How do you tell him, I don't have what you need? Don't be the fig tree that he has to curse and say you'll be fruitful no more. Because when I need you, you never in place. When I need you, you never have time. When I need you, you're never fruitful. When I need you, you're never productive. When I need you, you can't be there. Don't let it be you. And Lord, please don't let it be me. The Bible said he lifted up his heart and therefore there was wrath upon him and upon Judah and upon Jerusalem. What you do can cause pain and trauma. Not, it, listen, let me tell you something. It ain't never just you. Somebody out there, you're fighting to turn your life over to Christ. You need to be saved. You need to confess out your mouth and believe in your heart to salvation. It is the power and salvation to all those who believe. You need to call upon the name of the Lord so you can be saved. Whether you used to be saved, whether you used to go, I'm not talking about attending church. I'm talking about have you surrendered your life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. I'm telling you, you're going to have to call on the name of the Lord Jesus and ask him to save you. You need to be saved. Going to church ain't good enough. Being a good person ain't good enough. Going, you know, paying your tithes and offer ain't good enough. You need to be saved. Because let me tell you, many of you, your family, your friends, your connections are suffering because of your pride. You too prideful to depend on something outside of yourself. You too prideful to, to, to depend and surrender to something greater than you. Your pride won't allow you to surrender yourself to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Your pride won't let you can submit to a ministry or leadership. You're too great. Uh-uh, you can't do all of that. I, 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 I implore you by the mercies of the living God. Today, heart, not your heart. But surrender. <laughs> Come on, somebody. Surrender your life. Don't allow. Listen, we've been on this series about pride, uh, about our ego. Do not allow your ego to hinder your salvation. Do not allow your ego to stop the progression, the promotion, the growth that God is trying to give you in your life. God trying to give you your best life. You ain't got your best life. You don't have your best life without Christ. But he wants to give you your best life. And I didn't come to tell you that you won't have some rainy days. I didn't come to tell you that you won't have some hard nights. But I come to tell you that every day in God is better than any day outside of him. Because whatever happens, you know that you got a seat in the kingdom. Listen, guys. I've been prideful. And if nobody ain't told you, you've been prideful. I don't let my ego get out of control at times of my life. And so have you. To the most humble. Hear this man. He think he's humble. And that's what pride would do. Pride would make you think that you're exempt. From you can't be prideful. You can't deal with that because you love God and you love people, and that's just not you. You help everybody. You could be prideful because you help people. I want to tell you what is the remedy for your ego? Humility. What are you saying? <laughs> humble yourself. He told the people, humble yourself. Come on here. He didn't just humble himself because you're a leader. When you do it, the people will follow. The same way the people can get wrapped up in pride, you be prideful, the people will be prideful. But if you humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, he will exalt. The reason why you ain't been promoted, because you're too busy puffing yourself up. God said, what am I going to do with that? But if you humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, he will exalt you in due time, in due season, when he get ready. That's a problem. We want him to exalt us when we get ready. And he want to do it when he get ready. That's your issue with God. Because he's not moving by your timetable. I felt your resistance there. I felt them darts. 
But I got the shield of faith, devil. Listen, listen. <laughs> the shield of faith blocking it. But I come to tell you today, let's walk in humility. Let this whole series about pride. Listen, go listen to it over and over again. Go back to the first message, the second message. Whatever you need to listen to, you need to hear again that will cause you to walk in the place of humility. Do it. Do it. Do it. Whatever it's going to take for you to remember that God is in control, do it. But humble it. Bring your wonderful self down. Bring your intelligence, skillful, uh, talented, beautiful, got the best hair self down. Body the best in the world, bring it down. Got the prettiest eyes in the whole world, bring it down. Got the best GPA, bring it down. Got the best education, bring it down. Oh, you passed at the bar the first time. Bring it down. No matter what you great at, humble it. Humility is the key. It is the cure for your ego. It is the cure for pride. Humility. Humble yourself. Walk in humility. and Let the God that we serve do it. Listen, this completes our series on our ego and pride, because we are not gods. We are not in control, but we serve a God that's in control. Listen, I, I, I want to remind you, I, I want to implore you by the mercies of God that you go back, listen to this. You can go on YouTube, subscribe to our, our channel, go back, listen to these messages. Let these messages minister to you. Be inspired by these messages. Be corrected by these messages. Let them go back and minister to you. Listen, none of us are exempt from the pulpit to the floor, from my home to yours. We're all trying to be our best selves. We're trying to do it the right way. And these are the faces of pride. We can go from a face of defense to the place of victory where we prideful about the victory we had. So we have to look at the pride has many faces and many facets. But whatever face, whatever facet that it is, the solution is humility. We must repent of our pride, humble ourselves, and walk in faith and watch God do what he does in our lives.